everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. Today is my pleasure to welcome Director Danny Boyle. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we're here for train spotting. T2 train spotting. Yes. Uh, and it's 21 years later. So you guys took a crack at writing a sequel a while back. And you know, you've mentioned that it didn't quite work. And so you guys came back and revisited. What was it between the, that version and the one you've just written that really was like the difference between like, this is actually a movie we want to make? I think, it, I think it was that we were very, um, I, I'm sure that version was fine. But we, there was no reason to make it other than the fact that Irving had published a novel. And it, and it felt like a commercially, you know, adept thing to do. And, and then when you read it, you just, feel, you just felt wretched. And I think, I think the reason for that was that the, you realised that um, if you were going to approach it again, because there was this affection for the original that, that it's sustained, that people would be incredibly disappointed if you just went back for it for that reason. So it was kind of risky. Commercially, it's obvious to go back to it. Um, but actually, in truth, it was very, very, it's very risky. Unless you had something personal, some real powerful reason to make it, like we had for the, the first time we, we approached the book, which nobody wanted us to do because people couldn't see how it could become a film and the kind of type of people it was about was, were, were, would, were, would not be attractive on film. And, 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 the, and more than that, they would be unacceptable, really. But we had a passion for that. And you have to find that passion in a new version, otherwise you'll, you'll, you'll just end up disappointing people. And, um, and then they will crucify you, and rightly so, because you've kind of gone back to something that has, has a value in their life, that you're, you're lucky to have that place, you know? So it was, it was age, really. And, 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 and um, for, for, for all of us involved, for, for me and the screenwriter initially, John, who, who had himself a bit of a medical emergency, um, I don't know, have you seen the film? Have any of you seen it yet? No. Well, there's a kind of like, you'll see there's a kind of like, so I know what to give away and what not to give away. Anyway, there was, he, um, he'd had a kind of medical emergency which gave him a bit of a crisis, and that's the focus part of the film. It's what triggers the reignition of their time together and their, their friendship again. Um, and then it was really, it was weird doing it because it, it the film is really, you real, part of making the film was realising what the first film was about, which we didn't really know because everybody said it's a drug film and we said, no, it's not. It's a film about friendship and things like that. But actually, the first film is a study of energy and youthhood or boyhood, if you like, is a better way of putting it. And this is actually about the transition and how badly men make it to manhood, really, is sort of what it's about, really. And, uh, and we learned while making it how much, although women get terrible flack for age and time, actually women age much better than men. Way better. Men are terrible at it. They just, we hang on to the past in a way that's actually eventually embarrassing and you don't realise it. Um, and you'll see that in the film, really. And, it's one, of the, and it's, it's one of the things that makes the film attractive because they do try and relive the past. That's not just a commercial reason to do it. They literally do try and... The, the effortless bravado of the past is kind of so attractive to them. And there's a couple of sequences where they do that. But actually, it's inappropriate now, in a way. And, and anyway, and women age much, much better. And there are women in the film who, um, they don't have a huge amount to do, but what they do, they do devastatingly well, really, unlike our guys. Yeah, yeah. Women, women have always been sort of a catalyst for the characters in this, for me at least as a viewer. I'm like, OK, well, they're you know, part of, yeah. of what has driven them, these guys to do these things. And it was interesting because both Diane and, and Gail's characters are back in this. And the whole cast is back. Yeah. Um, but was there ever a point where you guys were like, actually, we might explore? And we do see more of that with like Bigby's family. But were you ever considering putting more of the female perspective in, or is it? I mean, obviously, the first one is so much about like this, this guy dynamic. Yes, it is, and and and, and it was, um, it was. I mean, we did when we set up the film. The um, the key questions that people asked is, would the four guys that come back again to be at the centre of the film? Would it be the same actors? And, and, but the second question people always ask is, would Kelly MacDonald come back to, to play Diane? And, uh, and she does. And, uh, and, but we had another scene for her later, so she did have a bigger part to play. And we cut it because it diminished her. And it's weird the way film works. It doesn't work like it is on the script at all. And it's slightly, it was better that she just has this one central scene, which she does beautifully. 
and 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 it, and it's devastatingly clear what <laughs> how much more successfully she's dealt with time than than Renton has dealt with time. Um, and uh, so we actually, if anything, in editing we reduced it really. Their agency is very important in the in the film, but it is quiet. Yes. And, and that's not to say there aren't strong female characters in it, but it was it was interesting because they were returning. Um, uh, you know, family and father son dynamics are also a big part of this. Um, again, as a viewer, at least I felt. And and I'm curious, like, you know, in the first one, it is all about youth and questionable moral decisions. But adding a family layer definitely sort of changes that. Were you at all afraid that it would adjust like the tone, or was it just like, no, this is actually the way, the best way to display some of these? Evolutions of these characters. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of kids running around all the way through it. Some of them are uh, kind of from from some of them are images of themselves as children. Some of them are, are their children, uh, who are very disappointed in their fathers, and some of whom are imaginary children. In one of the characters' cases, um, um, and, and obviously it's kind of from from a, from a commercial point of view, that's very unattractive because everybody wants to believe still <laughs> that they're like they were in the first film, where they were running around in this completely care, careless world. But it, it's, it's honest about really where they are. And it, and it was quite interesting that the four actors all became fathers after that film, um, the original film. They weren't fathers when we made that film, and they've all become fathers now. So it is very much a, uh, like you said, it's a look at fatherhood in, in different relationships with their own children and, and also with their own fathers in a way. There's a couple of key scenes about their own fathers as well. So that dynamic's very important to it as well, which doesn't make it sound very attractive. It makes it sound rather kind of, I can hear it as I'm saying it. You think, oh my God, what have they done to train spotting? But actually, it's really, there's an honesty in it that's really uh, essential to it, really. And you, and you have to find this balance. When you do a sequel like this, you, you, there's an extraordinary balance you have to find between everybody wants it the same, but different. And it's that kind of thing where it's got to be, it's got to have these trigger points, these kind of muscle memories of the first film, but also to have any honesty, it's got to be different because they're 46 now, you know, not 25. Um, so it's the difference in that, really. Um, one, of the, one of the things with that is like, there is a good deal of humor in this, right? It's not like a dark, like we're, we're making it sound very dark and dramatic, <laughs> but there are plenty, like, uh, there's a ton of humor, but how do you balance like those moments, and how do you make sure that humor is something that's universal? Because there was also a lot of the, you know, a lot of it does have to do with UK culture and and the source material. But you know, how how do you manage that ship? <laughs> like, you can't really think like that, really, because that's very much a studio perspective. How can we make sure this humor applies everywhere? And it's deadly, I think. You know, I mean, it's not in terms of. Pixar and things like that, um, you know, they do it brilliantly. But in terms of the stuff I do, it would be deadly if you started to worry about how's that going to play, <laughs> especially with characters like this. Because again, you, the first thing you do is start reducing their accents so they were more comprehensible, which would be incredibly untruthful to them as characters, because their 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 accents is uh, identifies them in a way. It's it's a kind of defiant pride in in how local their culture is, you know verbally anyway, and the linguistics that's in Irving Welsh's books are like that. The book is a challenge to you from the get-go. As soon as you open it, it's like, that's a challenge, and can I do it? And, it, and, and obviously, as the way we know with accents, it, they unlock, if you're patient, they unlock very quickly for you. But you can't compromise that up front, which it would be the tendency to do, to make it more palatable, or to make sure that it travelled, really. You just hope that it will do, that people will see things in it that they recognize across cultures, I guess. I guess aging is a universal thing across cultures, whether or not we want it to be. It is. It's in um, the post for all of us. So it's, it will be there, even though you don't like acknowledging it sometimes. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it's there for everyone, president, whether you're president or whether you're homeless. It's the same applies. Is, if you could go back 21 years and tell yourself one thing about where either your journey or where this film's journey was going to take you, would you take the opportunity? And if so, what would you tell yourself? Oh my God, that's like those letters that people write to themselves as younger people. <laughs> oh my God, I don't know what I'd say really. I've been very lucky really with the stuff I've done. I mean, I think I'd probably put more time in with my kids really. I, I haven't because I've been out doing stuff like this and making films and stuff like that. So I suppose I'd say look out for that a bit more really because the kind of, you can't repeat it back again. <laughs> but that sounds terribly depressing thoughts really. Um, <laughs> Yeah, enjoy culture, really. 
That's all. That's that's the that's the most important thing. I think it's weird. We were just talking about this before about um, someone said um, what we so so Renton in the film has a terrible crisis. His relationship in Amsterdam was broken down, and that's and what's one of the things that drives him back. And he has nothing. The relationship is broken down. She's taken the house that they were living in. He has these kind of well, I won't tell you, but because uh, that will spoil it. But he, he is in crisis about. And, th and this guy said to me, what would you say to a guy like that who's 46? He has a line in the film where he says, I'm 46 and I'm fucked. Um, uh, what would you say to a guy like that? And I was trying to think, what would you say to someone like that? And it, I, I, all you would say is re reach for culture, really, because it can save you in a way that I, I've learned over time. Um, and, and, when we, and, the, and the future that we all face now with jobs becoming more remote or becoming, uh, you know, um, not being there anymore because of robotization or mechanization or you just reach for culture, you know, it'll save you in the end. That's my own personal philosophy, you know. It's like that thing, you know, you re why do you read? You read, that, that's what they say, isn't it? You, when you read a novel, you read to know you're not alone. That's why we read, weirdly. It's a solitary occupation, but actually you read to know you're not alone because you recognize things and, re and that re the reach of culture is... And, and I know it's t a terrible time at the moment because, the, and it certainly is in Britain, the way culture is just sneered at and kind of disparaged. And it's, n and it's not about politics, culture. It's actually about something much more important than everyday politics. It's actually about something deep that connects people across cultures, across their individual cultures and, ac and across time, I think. I hope it'd be fair to say that the world as a whole, including like the UK and the US, have changed dramatically, like politically, since you guys even filmed the film, right? Like, forget since the first one, but since the production of this film, we've had a lot of changes. Yes, you have. Uh, better or worse. Um, yeah, Brexit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But is there any part of the film that took on sort of an additional context for you because of the time that it was getting released now? Well, they they come in and out of focus weirdly. I remember we 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 we, we shot. The, the, we shot 28 days later, um, which, and when we, it, it's a horror movie that we made, of kind of, but, and, and when we shot it, the idea of the film was that it was about social rage, because there'd been a number of instances, which you hear about occasionally, but there'd been a particular number of instances in Britain of people literally having arguments in, in, in traffic jams and getting out and stabbing each other, you know, that kind of incredible intolerant rage of each other that was happening. So that was our philosophy for the film. That was like, wow, we'll make a film about social rage. And the thing that drives these zombies was actually a kind of intolerance of each other. And that was our philosophy and everything. We set out to make the film. We shot the opening in London in the summer, you know, when he's wandering around London on his own and it's empty. And then we started shooting the main body of the film and 9-11 happened. And the film came out and the film was not about social rage. It was about the vulnerability of cities. It was weird. About, and, it was, and, it was, and I think it, the film was a hit here, and I absolutely know that was the reason, because it was, it was the first film out of the block that dared look at the terror of feeling incredibly vulnerable in these amazing cities we build for, each, for ourselves. And so you can't predict that, you know, you just, there's no way you'll know that. So sometimes they swim in and out of focus, really, and you can't say what they'll be. They take so long to make. They're bound not to be applicable to daily politics. I mean. Otherwise, you'd make documentaries and make them very, very quickly and, and get them out, like John Lennon used to say. You'd sing the song in the morning and have it on the streets in the afternoon. But um, otherwise, they're never going to be up to date. But you do read things into them, for sure. And um, I don't know what you'd read into this one about Brexit and about Trump or anything like that. You, I, I just don't know. Maybe people will see things in them that has some kind of resonance on on that level. I won't spoil anything. I, just because there were a couple moments where I was like, oh, okay, that's that's something that, I don't know if that was the filmmaker's intention, but it for me, where I live and you know the climate I live in, that had a different meaning than yeah. I think it might have originally. But well, we were, shoot, we were shooting when the Brexit vote happened, and there is a kind of, there's a plot element in it to do with the European Union, but we, kind of get, we couldn't get our heads around the ramifications of it, so we, we just shot it anyway, and, it, and it's in the film as, as it is at the moment, though we still don't know what will actually happen with Britain and, and Europe fully, although it looks like Brexit will happen, yeah. It, and if it does happen, Scotland will almost certainly go independent. That seems very clear, because, well, although we were shooting there at the time and, and it was, a, it was, an, it was a, a vote to leave the European Union, 
Uh, Scotland voted 62% to stay in. So Scotland will break away from the United Kingdom and stay in Europe. The Scots don't like the English anyway. They never have done, not since 1707 when they were bonded together. So the opportunity to finally get away from them, they, and they'll pally up to the French much more than the English anyway, the Scots, they're always known for that. That's called the old alliance, the relationship of Scotland and France. It, it is interesting how like the first film just took on this, like it became this purely Scot like a Scottish thing, right? It's it's. Is it interesting for you not being Scottish, first of all, to be at the helm of that? And to see the second one, given that timing, come out, like reignite that sort of like, yeah, Scotland pride. Like, you're like, am I going to be responsible for this? Like, I don't know. You, it is interesting working in Scotland. I, I, I did enjoy it. They are tough. They don't suffer fools gladly. There's no kind of Hollywood welcome of kind of like, you know. Um, and, you, and, you, and you have to earn your right to be there, really, to work there, especially in film. Terms. I felt that very strongly in making the, the first film. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not, nor would I claim to be an honorary Scot. <laughs> I, I'm far too canny to uh, ever uh, say that. My background is actually Irish. I come from Manchester, a town in the northwest, of, an industrial town in the northwest of England. And, and my heritage is all Irish, really. So maybe that was why they accepted me. You know. Anyway, we did. We, it's Johnny that it applies to more than anything, actually. Johnny Lee Miller, who's one of the four guys, because he's not Scottish. And um, when we made the first film, he, adapt he did that method thing where he just adapted the Scottish accent in his daily life as well. And I remember Kelly MacDonald, who was, she was really upset when we stopped filming because he, he, they were at, we were having a party afterwards and he was talking in his natural accent. She was really upset that he'd lied to her all the way through, you know, and she was really genuinely very upset about it. She still talks about it now, because she'd been completely taken in by him um, as, an, uh, as, an, as, a, as a, a, a fake Scot, really. So. Say that's like the highest compliment as an actor, I assume, yeah, that you yeah, like, I was, I was like, another yeah, Scottish yeah. actor. But like. you still have to deal with her upset. So this, is like, this is true. This is so hard. Um, you, and, you and Johnny worked together like super recently too, right, on Frankenstein. Um, Sorry? Frankenstein? Yes, yes, we yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, it, is it sort of interesting shifting mediums like that and like coming back to not only film with him, but something that you know, he and the rest of the cast had been with so long ago? Yes, it was um, extraordinary. Like one of your key jobs as a director, a large part of your job as a director with actors is that they're often very, uh, they're like on eggshells at the beginning. They're a bit careful, a bit wary of doing too much too soon until they find their feet and, and understand what the process is and how, the, how close they are to the character and stuff like that. And part of your job as a director is to encourage them um, over that chasm of confidence, really, to get them to step forward, especially because I quite like big performances. I'm not a kind of mumblecore, kind of so, social realist, kind of just do nothing with the lines, just let the camera do everything. I quite like performance. Um, but on this, it was the opposite. They had that built into them because they, they'd obviously been in the first movie. It had done very well for everyone. And they personally felt absolutely in charge of that character. And they were very clear about what that character would and wouldn't do. You know, they, had a, an, a, they knew him, even though they hadn't done him for 20 years. So that was weird. They... they um, you had to step up as a crew and as a director, you had to lift yourself straight away because they were at they were at 100% straight away, which is unusual on a film. You know, normally you're you're pussyfooting around for the first few days, really, and you can often see that in a film, which is obviously done out of order. But you can often see the films that aren't quite, and they're often the first days of filming where people are not sure of what, what they're doing. But there was none of that. No, they were fully ready to go. What was the first thing you guys filmed for it? The first scene we thought. Yeah, the first scene. So when people watch, they can know. <laughs> There's a scene under a pub where Begbie comes back and sees Sick Boy for the first time. Is the, so that's the Robert Carlyle character and the Johnny Lee Miller character. And they go under the cellar of the pub and, and where there is a dope farm, because he's doing a bit of cultivating on the quiet, Sick Boy. And they have this discussion about taking revenge on Renton together. And you, you'll see that's the first scene we shot. And the crew were shocked at how big the scene was straight away. Like, um, and we all had to lift our game from there, you know? Speaking of drugs. Um, oh, right. <laughs> right. No, um, so I, 
again, the world has changed a great deal since, and I don't know if heroin and heroin use, and like even drug use aside from maybe like the fight over here, at least over like is, should marijuana be legal? Like, I feel like it has taken sort of a back seat, and you guys do address a little bit about like the other ways people distract ourselves, if it's digital, if it's, you know, running, um, but, but was there ever temptation to sort of update more of the story to be involved more of these like other distractions that people are more engaged in? No, the, the, I mean, there is a big speech about it. Um, he, he does have a Choose Life speech, which is sort of an update, really, of his, what was quite a famous speech about, you know, the choices that society offers, and he, there is an update. I think you guys have mentioned in it at one point. Yep. I, um, <laughs> but well, that's, that's probably, again, it's one of those subjective viewer things where you're like, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the different choices that are available, social media now, et cetera, along like that. But actually, the speech is really about it's, it's actually a confession in the end that um, he hasn't made good choices, really. It's, it becomes a confession by the end of it. Um, no, I, and, and I think like the drug use thing, there are, there are some drugs in the film, but again, it's appropriate to 46-year-old guys. So there's a lot more Viagra in the film than there is um, some of the other dr uh, drugs of, of choice in the, in, in the first film. So... In fact, Begbie takes so much Viagra at one point, he, medically his heart would explode, but it doesn't, fortunately, for the film. But um, you, you have to see that to see what happens, what does explode, yeah. So is that the type of thing you have to do research in before? Like, okay, he can take this many pills before... <laughs> well, then you get an editor and you just jump cut together him taking lots of her, uh, Viagra pills. So It's, it's um, fake. It's not fake Viagra, but it's... Um, Viagra from China rather than right. um, Counter so street, counterfeit, street, yeah. counterfeit, straight Viagra. Yeah. Um, so, what do you, what do you think the role of failure is? Because these are characters who fail time and time again, mm. and they keep going. And I don't know if they're like I. I'm sure we all we're humans. We experience failure, right? And it's it's either internalized and like, hey, I think this is a failure, when really it's people could be like, this is a smashing success. So, how, what do you think like that role plays either in the characters, in filmmaking, in life? The film is, as characters, they are failures, absolute failures. I mean, in the first film, the the only success in the first film is that he steals the money off his friends, which is, can hardly be looked at as a triumph, can it? Um, so it's, it's saturated with failure, really. But film is odd, and especially film that has a sense of humor and a kind of independence of spirit, it doesn't come across like that, does it? You don't think when you leave the other film, wow, they're failures, aren't they? If anything, you kind of like think they're cool. You're really. rooting for them. You're rooting yeah, for you're these like morally really, reprehensible. But also, <laughs> but also they're attractive as well, even though they are morally reprehensible. And it carries on into this film as well, I think is that, you know, they're not... Un until Spud does something right at the end of the film, which is truly transformational in a way that you'd never expect, I don't think, what they amount to is failures, you know? Um, but again, film has that weird thing of elevating people. And it's why we cut the... The scene we were talking about earlier, about this Diane scene that we cut, we cut it because it made her... Ironically, it made her look like a failure. No matter how we played it or cut it, it made her look like a failure which is completely wrong, you know? And yet that's because you're following Renton. You're emotionally empathizing with Renton, really. With, presumably without fully understanding the crisis he's in. You, I mean, it is very, the film does mythologize people. And, and it was one of the interesting things about, about doing this film, and I explained it to the actors before we started, that we were going to unlock that image people had of them in the first film. Because film is extraordinary. It is, film is time. It, isn't it? It, 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 it? When you edit film, it's, it, all you're doing is, is extending time or compressing it. That's what you do with editing. It's just that the whole time. And, and you have this additional power where you can freeze time. And I think we do that in movies. We have a, you know, especially our favourite movies, we have an image in our mind of an actor in a part, like Uma Thurman in Pulp Fiction. You just have an image, or John Travolta in Pulp Fiction. You just have an image of them and you just freeze it in time. And, and I said to the actors, that was one of the things we were going to try and do, was unlock that, 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 that frozen moment with them, um, which would be very cruel on them. And it is very cruel. You know, where you see them in the, in the way you remember them, the skinny, cool guy who sneers at everything, and here's the update, right next to each other like that, you know? Um, and it is extraordinary like that film that it can do that. Um, and it, 
as an as an art form, it's I don't think there is another art form that gets that's anywhere close to having that connection with time like film does. You know, how how do you achieve something like that? Do you it's talking about that like that particular scene where you're bringing back basically the ghosts of the versions of them past. Like, do you have someone on set who's the stand-in? Do you show them that scene beforehand? Do you wait and not show them that scene until afterwards? Some of it was done afterwards. I, I had warned them that we were going to do it, but it's done afterwards in, in effect. You, you, I mean, you use tricks. You, you can have stand-ins to... We cast a lot of young guys who look like them in the first film, including one young guy who'd been tormented throughout his school life because he looked just like Ewan McGregor in train spotting, And he'd grown up with this. Everybody teased him about it and finally got his arm back. He got to be Ewan McGregor. And that was bizarre, Ewan seeing him. You know, for the first time he ever met him, because he was dressed as Ewan was in the first film. And then you meet this kind of doppelganger, like, um, what's the great Kislovsky film? There's a great Kislovsky film about the double, the double life of Veronique. It was a wonderful film. Um, you get to meet, that, that's what they say, isn't it? There's a double of you somewhere in the world, out there. There is an absolute double of you. And statistically, I think that's true, isn't it? kind of the number of statistical chances of there being someone, there, is, there will be somebody out there who you would, if you met them, they would be, it would be like meeting a mirror. Anyway, that was weird for the actor seeing that. But you use, sometimes you use a double, sometimes you use footage from the original film. Um, yeah, we, do, we didn't use, they've changed so much, you can't use them as their own standings at all under any circumstances, you know, because they really do look, it is very honest about the film about what they look like now. Uh, did you experience at all like a sense of deja vu? Because you shot in some of the same places. Obviously, you're dealing with the same characters and actors. Or was it like, nope, this is just a new experience? The, the, the most acute moment was when we went to Karua, which is this countryside place. In the first film, there's a, a speech where he says it's shite being Scottish. And they go out to the countryside for 10 minutes. And they hate it, you know. And they decide to go back and take drugs instead. And <laughs> there is a new scene out there again. And we went out there, and it is, obviously exactly the same and, and to the mountain of course these people passing in front of it are like a fly just moving across it like, but that's 20 years to the mountain it's just like a movement like that um, that brings you down to earth yeah seeing that so that's a kind of and it is a very very important moment in the film where they um, there is a reckoning moment there really where they uh, some of Tommy who who they went out to the countryside with who died of his his addiction um, there's a reckoning about that in the film as well, yeah, at that moment. I would like to know, who inspires you as a director? As a director? Yeah. Um, or as a human, but mostly as a director. <laughs> if they're I different. <laughs> I like that young... I, did, you, did you see Don't Breathe? That horror movie? I thought that was so... I remember watching that. As a director, you watch stuff sometimes and you think, fucking hell, he can really direct that guy. <laughs> I thought that was really good. Um, What's he called? Fede Alvarez. Fede, Fede, uh, Fede Alvarez, I think he's called. I remember thinking that. So, but sorry, that's just jealousy. That's not inspiring. <laughs> um, um, and you no, know, I, I um, one of your local, I mean, Coppola is one of my big, huge inspirations, you know. And not just as, a, from everything I've read about, I mean, I met him once, actually. I was like, it's terrible meeting your heroes. I was jelly, absolute jelly. I mean, I'm a grown man, and I was just shaking meeting Francis Ford Coppola, who's just like, who doesn't really care, but everybody's like that with him, I think. Um, so that was quite special. But everything I've read about him um, also confirms what a special person he is, and I think his work is, certainly from one particular period, is as good as it gets, really. You know, uh, that's a big good thing for me. And another British director, who's also a very, very fine man, is very, very elderly now, Nicholas Rogue. They're, they're big inspirations for me, but on a personal directing level. Yeah. Do you find it challenging watching other people's work? Um, like, do you, or do you find that you're able to disconnect, or is it watching it and just being like, "Oh, I want to do that," and why did he get to do that first? And no, no, no. <laughs> you, I'm very, I'm very good actually. I, I, unless it's terrible, when you do start to take it apart, um, I don't take stuff apart at all. I kind of get it lost in it and kind of cry and. Um, emolt and shout and don't breathe. I was shouting. There were like 20 of us in the audience in London watching it in this cinema in Stratford. Just, and we were shouting and screaming at the, you know, which you don't hear a lot in England. It's kind of, you do get that a bit more here uh, in cinemas here. I like that when, when audiences emolt like that and start shouting, but you don't, everybody sits in respectful silence in England. Um, 
But uh, yeah, no, I'm more like I, I, so. I don't take it apart. No, I tend I tend to get lost in it. Really, which I'm very grateful I do. Really, and um, especially on planes. I was reading that about someone saying why we cry on planes. Do you, do you, I, I do cry at movies more on planes than on Earth. I've, I've heard. I'm not kidding. I've heard it's like the elevation. And yes. It's just like <laughs> there's something about that that <laughs> makes the tear ducts run more. The pressure, the pressure. Yeah, it's on. to do with pressure. It doesn't or something matter if it's like a sad that. movie. I think why am I crying? Yeah. It's like a Kira Knightley movie, and I'm crying. It's like weeping. And this is not a very good movie about her wanting to be a rock star. That's what. But I'm crying anyway. Um, so you've covered a lot of cinematic ground since the first one. Uh, you've gone to the slums of India, the canyons of Utah. You've gone to Silicon Valley, uh, Frankenstein's lab, space. Uh, what's something you haven't done yet that you would like to? Musical. Absolutely. Really? Oh, yeah. No, that is, I think, for any director, um, that's the one, that's the grail, the, the, the holy grail that you, you'll, you'll probably never get to. And if you do get to, it probably won't work. But a, a, a modern, um, original musical is virtually impossible to pull off, you know. Obviously, there's been one very recently that did work. But they're very, very, to get your characters to sing, to actually just that moment of singing, that's the kind of terror moment. Can you do that? Um, so I, 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 I'm still trying to do that in a way. I was going to say, there's a very key musical moment in this film that was like fascinating to watch and just given you know, like the stakes of the circumstances they were in. Oh, so, yes, yeah, no, yeah. that's a good scene, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I love know, a bit. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I love a bit of singing. I love a bit of singing in movies and a bit of dancing and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but it's the original concept. We, we, we did a kid's film called Millions, which is a lovely little film about two boys who find a sack of money and it changes their lives. And, um, and that was originally meant to be a musical. And we, were, we had this idea that we get Noel Gallagher to write the songs for these kids, because it was set in Manchester, uh, where Noel comes from as well. And we kind of chickened away from it. You need a lot of confidence to pull it off. And we, I, we just seemed to lack it at that moment. And we made it as a straight film. And it's a lovely film, I'm very proud of it, but um, it, it should have been a musical, because those kids could have sang, and you'd have never questioned why they were singing, or you'd have loved them singing, you know? Anyway. I mean, there is this sort of trend of like taking films, adapting them for the stage, and then putting them back as a musical film. Maybe Millions the Musical? Oh, On the yeah, West right. End? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to take that as a note. Are there any <laughs> genres that you like, don't necessarily have like, an inherent interest in directing, like westerns or animated films? Or is it everything just like the world's your oyster? I try, I try to do an animated film, uh, an adaptation of a Terry Pratchett book called The Bromliad. Okay, well, there's your first problem. Terry Pratchett is so hard to adapt. <laughs> yes, very difficult. Uh, God bless him. And, um, and we would, we, we, me and the writer of the Millions script, actually, Frank Cottrell Boyce, we set it up at DreamWorks. And, and we were warned all the time about how long it was going to take. And, uh, and, we, and, and we backed out of it in the end, because it really was. You, you, it's all very well somebody saying seven more years, seven years like that to you. And you just kind of go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get closer and you realize it is going to be seven years. And so we, we backed off it as well. It's a lovely script. It's a lovely, I don't know whether it'll ever see the light of day. So, um, so I think my last question is, uh, what's just one thing you'd like people to take away from this film? If you had to distill it down. I think it's the, it's what, so as we did the film, there's a kind of, one of the weird, one of the weird things about getting older, the, one of the, the few compensations about getting older is that, um, um, actually, Kingsley Amis said that the only compensation we're getting older is that at least you know what's funny and what isn't. I don't know whether that's true or not, but one of the few compensations I've found about age is that you, you have this weird recognition that time is not a straight line, that there's a kind of loop in it somewhere. And there is a section of the film, and it's to do with Spud at the end of the film, and he begins to recognize his voice, which in the original movie and, and in the original stories about him, he is a hopeless character, utterly chaotic and hapless and nothing ever goes for him. He's the ultimate addict in a way, on and off and on and off and on, and somehow he's managed to survive. But he finds his voice, really. And I think that something I believe in personally very deeply, and it's in Irving's work, is that no matter how 
impossible it seems for that person to have an important voice. Every voice is important. And that seems impossible thing to, impossibly platitudinous thing to say in the modern world where life is so complicated. But if you lose sight of that, you're lost, I think, you know, because you have to believe that all those, that, that, and it's just how they'll find the value in their voice, that's all. And, and he finds the value in his voice and it leads to a loop back where you, you start sort of experiencing the first film again um, in, in the second film and they loop back on each other. And uh, I love that. I don't know whether people will get that from the movie, but they'll probably just have a good time watching you and Gregor make a fool of himself or, you know, stuff like that. But um, that's very important to me in the film, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was a Google Talk. It was a Google Talk. Right.